God of salvation, break into our world with your great power and glory. Break the chains that bind us to sin. Shatter the systems of our world that promote injustice and oppression. We light the first Advent candle as a sign of our hope that God's Messiah is coming. May we stay alert from His coming that we might hear with all of creation the redemption song of our God. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Well, good morning. We're glad that you're here with us this morning online uh, to worship with us this morning. And, you know, something that, that, that came across my mind just a few minutes ago was that they can take our places of worship, but they can't take our hearts of worship. I want to read some scripture to you this morning before we get started. It's from Psalm 63 verses 2 and 4 from the message, and it says this, So here I am in the place of worship, eyes open, drinking in your strength and glory, in your generous love. I am really living at last. My lips bring praises like fountains, and I bless you every time that I take a breath. My arms wave like banners of praise to you. Yes, we are, we are nor normally in here worshiping, but you can make your house a house of worship this morning. Your worship is not confined to where you are as far as church because we've said it over and over, you are the church. So make your house, your living room, your vehicle, wherever you are this morning, a place of worship and just praise the Lord just like you would praise Him in this sanctuary today. We are glad you're joining worship with us this morning. One, two, three, four!
Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, He is my song. And let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, He is my song. You are good, good. Oh, you, you are, are good, good. Oh, you are good, good. Oh, you are good, good.
please stand and join us in today's scripture reading. It is taken from Mark, the 13th chapter, verses 24 through 37. But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. Their stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it's near, right at the door. Truly, I tell you, this generation certainly will not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It is like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. These are the words of God for the people of God. Good morning, Grace people. Today we mark the beginning of a very special season in the life of the church. That season is called Advent. From the Latin word Adventus, which means coming or expecting. Advent usually begins uh, the beginning of the church liturgical calendar year. It's a time of expecting, it's a time of waiting, and it's a time of preparation to celebrate both the Nativity at Christmas and the second coming of Christ, which is called the Parousia. So Advent is a season of anticipation for Christmas, as well as the second coming of Christ. Today, Gus lit our first Advent candle on the Advent wreath. It was the candle of hope. When it comes to Advent, the hope that we share is twofold. First off, there's hope that we find in the salvation that's offered through humanity from the sins of the world. I don't have to go far into detail to tell you that the world in which we live is sin sick. It's filled with evil. There are things that happen all around us that are not of God. And so in this sin sick world, scripture tells us that we're all a part of that, that each one of us is guilty of sin for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now throughout the history of Israel, God promised the coming of the Messiah, the Messiah, the Savior. There are over 40 identified prophecies concerning the coming of the Messiah throughout the Old Testament. One of the very first promises of the coming of the Messiah that we find in the Old Testament is found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This comes before Adam and Eve were exiled from the garden. God said to the serpent, I will put an enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. But he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Another scripture that we find concerning the promise of the coming of the Messiah is found in 2 Samuel 7, 16. And it talks about the house and the kingdom of David that will be established before God and will rule forever and ever. This is the ruling of Jesus. When God makes a promise, you can bet that it'll happen, that God will fulfill his word. In Isaiah 7, 14, he said the promised Messiah will be called Emmanuel, God with us, and that he will be pierced 
for our transgressions. All of the prophecies concerning the Messiah are promises of God. The holiness and righteousness of God are contingent upon the ability of God to keep his promises. I'll say that again. The holiness and righteousness of God are contingent upon God's ability to keep his promises. So God is not only God of the word, God is the God who keeps his word. For over 1,900 years, the people of Israel lived on the promises of God through the prophets of the Old Testament. In 735 B.C., Isaiah promised the coming of Emmanuel. And in that time, oh, there were over 400 years of silence for the people of Israel. God did not speak to the people of Israel for 400 years between Malachi and the birth of Jesus. All they had to rest on were the prophets and the promises of God. There was no evidence that the promises were going to come true. There was no proof that God was moving. There were just promises. If God didn't deliver, if there was no fulfillment of the prophecies, there was really nothing Israel could do. It would have just been that God would have broken his word. But God didn't break his word. With the birth of Jesus, all 40 plus prophecies were fulfilled. All the promises throughout the Old Testament were fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. The hope of, re of Israel was realized when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. With the birth of Jesus came the fulfillment of the hope of salvation, not only for Israel, but for the entire world. John chapter 3, verse 16, reminds us that God's love isn't just reserved for Israel, but God so loved the world, the whole world, that he sent his one and only son, and that is Jesus, that we should all be saved. Hope for salvation is realized only through Jesus. And the promise of salvation is found exclusively in the word of God. That is our hope. Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death. And we know that we've all sinned and therefore we deserve death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's the gift of God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us that we're saved by grace through faith and not by works so that none should boast. 1 John 1, 9 tells us that if we confess our sins, that God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. John 14, 6, Jesus tells us that Jesus is exclusively the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. And Acts chapter 4 verse 12 tells us, there is no other name in heaven or on earth by which a person can be saved. And so we find that throughout uh, the New Testament there is promise after promise concerning the fulfillment of salvation through Jesus Christ. Jesus is our hope for salvation. Jesus is the hope of the world. God had no second plan. There's no plan B. There's no other way. Jesus is exclusively the means of salvation for all of humanity. That is the hope that we have. That hope is an anchor for our soul. Hebrews 6, 9 tells us that, that we have a hope that is an anchor for our soul. The world in which we live at oftentimes, at times, can be filled with waves of doubt and frustration and anger that buffet against us. There's other doctrines and theologies and questions 
challenges to our faith. Even during the Christmas season, there's going to be people that are going to be challenging the scriptures, the stories found in Matthew and Luke concerning the birth of Christ, whether or not Mary was a virgin, whether or not Joseph was really Jesus' father. And there's so many more questions that people ask or want to challenge. But in the midst of all of that, we know this. We have a hope, and our hope is Jesus, and that is an anchor for our soul. So that when all of the things buffet around us, when we're faced with tough decisions to make, when we live in a COVID-19 environment, perhaps we're not able to, to work, money's tight, we don't know what we're going to do, you have an anchor. And that's the hope that you have in Jesus Christ. That will get you through. We know that to be true. All other things will fail. All other things could fail us. But I promise you this, Jesus will never fail you. Hope in Jesus is unlike the fleeting type of hope that we express when we say things like, boy, I hope it doesn't rain today. We look at our weather app on our phone or on our watch and it says, oh, there's a 100% chance of rain today. Or we look outside the window and we see the clouds and the wind and, and even see a few drops on our window. And we realize that our hope is rather fleeting. I mean, when we say, I hope it doesn't rain, it still, it could rain. Or perhaps when we say things like, boy, I hope Texas beats Oklahoma today in football. Now we realize that Texas is a superior football team, but there is a chance, as fleeting as it may be, especially this year and last year and the year before. And Well, anyway, you get the picture. There's always a chance that Texas will not emerge victorious. Those are fleeting types of hope that we have. There's not really any certainty that things are going to emerge the way that we would like them to come out. However, when we talk about the hope that's an anchor for our soul, and we talk about Jesus Christ, that is more of a confident assurance than it is a fleeting desire. It is more of a confident assurance than a fleeting desire. We hope in the promises of God and Jesus Christ because he is our only chance for salvation. And we are confident that even when we don't understand things, even when things are happening that we can't see God at work, we know that the hope in Christ will get us through even when we struggle, we know that God is able to get us through whatever we're struggling with. We are confident in God's ability to keep his promise. And as such, we are confident in Jesus Christ for salvation. That's the first type of hope that we have. But then there's another type of hope. Advent not only celebrates the fulfillment of the promise concerning the birth of the Messiah, but it is also a season of expectancy. In Advent, we not only remember the fact that 2,000 years ago, Emmanuel, God with us, that God loved us enough to send his one and only son, and there in a manger he lay. We also remember in Advent, the promise that one day he will return. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Jesus gathers his disciples around him one last time. He is about to be betrayed and handed over into the hand of sinful men. And in that moment, Jesus says that he is going to leave them and go somewhere where they cannot go. But he makes a promise. And the promise is this, that if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and again and receive you unto myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And in that moment, that one moment, Jesus makes a promise. And it's a promise 
of the return of Christ, the parousia, the fact that there's going to be a day when Jesus is going to return once again to receive his bride unto himself and bring his church home. That is a promise that God has yet to fulfill because Christ has not returned yet. We wait expectantly. Uh, we long for and are eager for the time in which Christ will return. We know that it will happen and it may not be in our lifetime and, and there have been generation after generation that have longed for the coming of Jesus, that have not seen the return, but there will be a day when Christ will return and fulfill that promise. It has not yet been fulfilled, but soon and very soon. And I'm sure that there have been pastors throughout generation upon generation that have stood behind pulpits that have made the same claim, and it's not any less true than it was then, and that is that the time is drawing near. With every passing day, the opportunity for Christ to return is one day closer. We might not see it, but it'll happen, and it'll be happening soon. When we sing the song, O come, O come, Emmanuel, that is a, an Advent song. It's a song that we sing that we call out to Christ to return and bring his church home. You see, it's not a Christmas song. Jesus has already come. So when we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel, we're calling out for, we're inviting Christ to come back, to return to this earth that he created, to call his people home, to restore righteousness and order upon his creation, to establish a new heaven and a new earth. That's what we're calling out for every time we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. When we sing the song, Come, thou long expected Jesus, born to set thy people free from our fears and sins release us let us find our rest in thee israel's strength and consolation hope of all the earth thou art dear desire of every nation joy of every heart that is a longing call an invitation Come, thou long expected Jesus. In the midst of the unrighteous world in which we live, in the midst of the chaos and the confusion and the evil that we live in, come, thou long expected Jesus, and set this world aright, that there would be no more injustice, that not another child would go to bed hungry, that there would be no more injustice, that there would be peace on earth and goodwill toward men. And that will happen when Jesus comes. Church, there's coming a time. There is coming a day when Jesus' face we will see. We will look upon that face, the one who saved us by his grace. What a day, glorious day, that will be. There will be no sorrow, there will be no pain. There will be no suffering, there will be no COVID-19, there will be no cancer, there will be no Alzheimer's, there will be no heart attacks or strokes or illness. Every tear will be wiped away and there will be joy, oh joy, on that peaceful golden shore. What a day, glorious day, that will be. Church, that's our hope. Let you not, let none of us falter in the hope that we have in Christ. For he may tarry for another year or another day or a thousand years, but the hope will be fulfilled. That is our hope this Advent season as we light candle after candle, and we sing, O come, O come, Emmanuel. 
It's not just a remembrance of the fact that God sent his son at Christmas, but it's an invitation for Christ to return and call us home to our heavenly place. And the only thing that I ask you today to consider is simply this. Are you ready? Are you ready for the day in which Christ will return? Are you ready for the time in which Jesus will come back and call us home? If not, I would love to pray with you and talk to you about what that looks like. See, God gave us certainty in his promise and confidence in his word. We can know that in Jesus we do have salvation. We can put all our eggs in that basket. We can sink the ships and we can burn the bridges because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. If you'd like to pray about that or talk about that, what a wonderful opportunity it would be. I'd love for you to call the church if you're uncertain and talk to me. Talk to Gus or one of the other people on staff. We would love to share our faith and our hope with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, our hope is found in you. A hope that is certain, concrete, and real. We trust and we believe in your promises. It's all that we have is your word. We pray, O God, that you would instill within us that great hope in the midst of frustrations and fears and doubts. Remind us this Advent season, the hope that we have not only in a baby that was laid in a manger 2,000 years ago, but in a king that will return to call his bride home. And until that day, Lord, give us strength. Bless us, guide us, be with us, we pray, until the next time we gather together virtually again. For it is in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Blessings, have a wonderful Advent week, and go in peace. My hope is built on nothing less Than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But wholly trust in Jesus' name Sing it with this church, my hope is built my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest thing, but only trust in Jesus' name.
shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in Him be found, dressed in His righteousness alone. Faultless stand before the throne, Christ alone.